Hi, I'm Dr. Marty Rossman, and I've been a physician for over 45 years. I want to talk to you today about integrative medicine. Integrative medicine is the more current term for what we used to call holistic medicine, which I got interested in early in my career, mainly because I was working with people with chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, overweight, and so on, most of which were results of how people were living their lives, how they were eating, whether they were smoking, whether they were drinking too much. These represent about 80% of what any primary care physician sees in their office in America, and they're responsible for most of the major illness in America. When you work with people with chronic disease, you find out that you can't just simply treat them with medicine. That's why they're chronic. We can't cure them yet. We can just manage them and try to prevent some of the damage. So in working with people with chronic disease, if you can't get them involved with their care and you can't get them somehow to look at changing their lifestyle, changing the way they eat, changing the way they exercise, give up smoking, drug habits, and so on and so forth, you're not going to get very far. So I got interested early on in holistic medicine, but the term holistic, which really means trying to appreciate the whole person, body, mind, soul, spirit, lifestyle, really came to be besmirched because everybody and their brother was doing things that they would claim to work and they would claim that they were holistic and they really weren't holistic at all. So my colleague and friend Dr. Andrew Weil coined the term integrative medicine a few years ago and it's come to be accepted and it's come to be more and more a part of mainstream medicine. There are courses in integrative medicine now in probably 50 medical schools around the United States and all over the world. There are departments of integrative medicine, there's research in integrative medicine, and it's starting to be validated as a, a legitimate addition to our medical approach. So I call this talk, There's More to Medicine Than Medicines, and I'd like to look at some aspects of medicine and why an integrative approach can be much more useful than a simple uh, conventional approach. So in America, medicine is considered to be the diagnosis and treatment of disease. That's how it's actually defined. And our education and focus as doctors is on diseases. We study histology, we study pathology, we study the way the body works, physiology, and our focus is really on these diseases, which are considered to be entities of their own almost. And I find it kind of paradoxical and interesting that in what tries to be a very hard science, medicine, and it's really both science and art, and there's no getting away from that. But what tries to be a hard science really thinks of these diseases almost like discarnate entities in themselves, so that there's institutes for arthritis, there's institutes for heart disease, there's institutes for cancer. Well, this may be quibbling a bit, but our job in medicine is not just to take care of diseases, it's to take care of the people that have the diseases. And so we learned very little as doctors in medical school about some of the basics of health, like nutrition, like psychology and mind-body medicine, like the effects of exercise and movement, like stress and ways to manage stress. And these are absolutely critical in working with people, and I hope to demonstrate that to you. So. Conventional medicine, the goal is to eliminate or reduce the burden of disease, and that's a good thing. Treatments are largely pharmaceutical, uh, surgical, radiation, using medical devices, and they can be useful sometimes, but they're not the whole picture. And what we bring to the equation in integrative medicine is that we're as interested in healing as we are in medicine. Healing is a process that's essential and innate to life. And you can think of your body as a four billion year old healing genius. It has inherited everything that life has learned over four billion years on earth to repair itself and to stay healthy in the face of all kinds of challenges that we face on a day to day basis. And what we like to do in integrative medicine is look at what helps to support those healing processes and what may get in the way. So we can help or hinder the natural healing abilities of the body through nutrition, good or bad, exercise and movement, 
attitudes and mind practices, mental practices to reduce stress and improve our attitude, body work, acupuncture in Chinese medicine, herbal medicine, and other kinds of approaches. So medicine and healing are really complementary. They're not mutually exclusive. But you may need some expertise to integrate them, and I think that's one of the major roles of an integrative physician. An integrative physician, like myself, is an MD, although many people who are not MDs call themselves integrative physicians. They're just not really physicians. They may be integrative, but they're not physicians. So an integrated physician has MD training and MD experience. We know what conventional medicine has to offer, but we've also put time and study into learning about nutrition, learning about psychology, learning about stress, learning about other approaches to medicine like Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, herbal medicine. All these things have additional things to offer on top of conventional medicine. When I see people that have serious illness or chronic illness, very frequently they're on medications and I have to know things like drug nutrient interactions or, or drug herb interactions and I have to know when it's appropriate maybe to reduce people's medications or take them off and add something that's safer and possibly even more effective. But you can't just yank people off of drugs or medications they're on without understanding their condition. Now healing modalities, uh, like many of the ones that I've mentioned, are often effective. They generally work quite a bit more slowly than pharmaceuticals, but they have the potential to really heal, not just ameliorate symptoms. Here's a good example. I see a lot of people that are on anti-inflammatory drugs. We know that inflammation in the body is one of the major uh, causes of a great deal of illness like arthritis, especially osteoarthritis. Inflammation throughout the system can create muscle pain and tiredness and aching, there's inflammation in autoimmune diseases like diabetes and certain kinds of thyroid disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Inflammation is kind of a basic process that's thought to be at the root. Heart disease, inflammation is a big issue and even in cancer, inflammation is a big issue. So there's a huge amount of medical research that's going on in inflammation and ways to reduce inflammation. The major thrust in conventional medicine is anti-inflammatory medications. So I see a lot of people that are on these anti-inflammatory drugs, they're called NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, for a long period of time. Now here's the deal. Those drugs are very effective in reducing inflammation, but they also interfere with certain housekeeping functions in the cells, certain functions that the cells need to do in order to keep themselves healthy. And so the longer people take those drugs, the more likely it is that they'll suffer side effects. The more usual side effects from anti-inflammatory drugs are irritation of the stomach lining, including gastritis, esophagitis, reflux, heartburn, esophagitis, duodenal ulcers, and so on. So that's a limiting factor. But even more so, when people take those for a long time, there's a high incidence of kidney damage and sometimes liver damage. That can be really serious because if you damage your kidneys in certain ways, you don't get that function back. So they're not completely benign. If you take, you know, so if you take ibuprofen once in a while, if you sprain something, you take it for a couple of days and you cool off some inflammation, that's one thing. A lot of people live on these drugs and they have a very high incidence of side effects, including something like 20,000 deaths a year in Americans from taking anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, to give you an idea of how that compares to other statistics, 40,000 people in America die from breast cancer every year. 20,000 die from taking ibuprofen and related drugs. So that's a lot of people. And the shame of it is, is that really doesn't have to happen because there's a lot you can do that's natural and safe to reduce inflammation, like going on an anti-inflammatory diet, which is pretty much the same diet that everybody recommends for good health. Lots of vegetables, fruits, um, lower on grains, and especially lower on refined uh, carbohydrates like refined flours and so on, 
eliminating sugar, refined carbohydrates, uh, put fuel on the fire for information. So if you go more towards a Mediterranean diet, a good, healthy, delicious, enjoyable diet, that will cut inflammation. Then you can add herbs like turmeric, which is a wonderful anti-inflammatory herb. Ginger, these things are tasty too. If you like Indian food, uh, you're getting a lot of anti-inflammatory substances there. Turmeric, ginger, boswellia, which comes from frankincense, um, is a terrific anti-inflammatory substance. Fish oils, or eating fatty fish like salmon or sardines, these are highly anti-inflammatory. So here's the deal. When we put people on fish oils and a combination of herbs like turmeric and ginger and boswellia, they're much, much weaker than the pharmaceutical drugs. They're much weaker. Ibuprofen is probably three to 600 times as potent as these herbs. And it works very quickly. If you take a couple of ibuprofen, when you've got aches or pains, usually in 20 or 30 minutes, you're feeling better. And you will not get that from the anti-inflammatory herbs. But at six weeks time, when researchers uh, check out the effects of inflammation in uh, experimental subjects, they can't tell the difference between the people who are taking the drugs and the people who are taking the herbs. So it takes three to six weeks to get there, but at six weeks you've got an equal effect. So what I often do in my practice, if somebody's in pain and they've got some inflammation that's really bothering them, put them on the anti-inflammatory medication for a few weeks, but also put them on the herbs and try to get their diet moved in the anti-inflammatory direction. And after about three to six weeks, you can take them off of the drug. The anti-inflammatory diet, you can stay on forever. There's no toxic side effects. As a matter of fact, not only is it good for inflammation, it's good for heart disease, it's good for hypercholesterol conditions, it's good for blood pressure. Um, it's essentially, it's uh, dementia preventing. It's the same diet that virtually everybody recommends for good health and for longevity and for feeling good for a long time. So there's no bad effects from that. You can stay on the herbs forever because they don't interfere with those housekeeping functions in the, in the cell. So I say, save the drugs for those acute situations where you need a quick response and you need to feel better quickly and then get on the anti-inflammatory program and herbs and you won't need to take the drugs and you'll save your kidneys and your stomach. The main thing with all of these, you know, choosing between all kinds of medical or integrative or alternative or complementary, they're, they're not good or bad. What a doctor really needs to help the patient do is evaluate the risk of the treatment on one hand and the benefit on the other. And if you've got something that has a lot of potential benefit and very low risk, like most of these integrative treatments are, like acupuncture, for, for instance. I've done acupuncture in my practice for 45 years. It's extremely, extremely low risk if you know what you're doing, and it has a high potential benefit. Things like relaxation techniques have virtually no risk and huge benefits. So what we want to use first are treatments that have a very high benefit to risk ratio. The less risk, the better. The more benefit, the better. And then save the things like pharmaceuticals that have not only benefit, but often have significant risks, even death, that's a pretty significant risk in my book. So even if there's a small number of deaths from pharmaceuticals, you know, I wanna save that to see if the natural healing approaches haven't worked and the person's in a lot of distress. And start, instead of automatically prescribing a pharmaceutical, which is what happens in most doctor's office, because Unfortunately, medicine has virtually been co-opted by the pharmaceutical companies. And 80% of the research in medicine is done by pharmaceutical companies. And of course, they're done on pharmaceuticals because they sponsor the research. They sponsor postgraduate medical education. 80% of what a doctor learns in postgraduate continuing medical education is sponsored and presented by pharmaceutical companies. So. It's heavily, heavily biased towards pharmaceuticals and has virtually come to be the distribution of pharmaceuticals. 
I think it's a shame. I think medicine is a sacred profession. It's that we have a responsibility to help people not only get treated and symptom relieved, but also heal when possible and get better. And we can't do that with pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals don't heal. The body heals from inside out when you support it properly. I wouldn't have so much concern about conventional medicine if it worked better than it did. And of course, there are those of you out there, I know that either you or somebody you loved has had their life saved by modern medicine. That includes me. People have had their lives saved. They've had a second chance to go on. There's some spectacular things we can do in modern medicine that we've never been able to do in any other form of medicine. So I'm not anti-medicine. It's just, especially for the chronic diseases, which are 80% of what we see, we can't cure them. And we need to focus much more on how to get the person involved and how to get healing going. And that's what I'm talking about here. In the United States, I think it's particularly bad because if you look at medical spending, for instance, as a percentage of the gross domestic product, um, the average in developed countries is about 9.5% of the gross domestic product is spent on medical and health care. In the United States, it's 17.6%. It's twice as much. We spend twice as much as the average developed country on medical and health care. And the second country to us, which is the Netherlands, spends 12%. We spend almost 18%. So we spend a third more than the second most country. We spend three times as much as the countries that spend the least, like Turkey and Mexico and Greece. That wouldn't be so bad if we got really good results, but we don't. We rank near the bottom on almost every major measure of healthcare in the world. If you look at life expectancy from birth, we rank 17 in, uh, for males and we rank 16 for females. Just about every other developed country has a longer lifespan than we do, and we're spending a third to double the amount of money that they are. Um, heart attack fatalities, the US rank of 32 developed nations, we're 12th out of 32. Life expectancy, again, we're down in 1718. This other study shows 22nd uh, in the world. Infant mortality, we rank 31st out of 34 countries. We spend all that money, we do all this technology, we use all these medicines and we rank 31st out of 34 in being able to uh, have live, healthy infants. Asthma management, unmet, the rank of unmanaged asthma, we're 27th out of 28 countries. Surgical complications, we're 16th out of 19th, 19 countries in the world. So we're not getting good value. It's not like we're spending more money because we have the best medical system and the best medical care in the world. We don't. We're not even close. Let's look at the leading causes of death in the United States. Heart disease is number one, about 600,000 people. Almost 600,000 die of cancer. The third leading cause of death in the United States is adverse reactions to prescription drugs. The third leading cause of death in the United States is adverse reactions to prescription drugs. 140,000 people a year die from adverse reactions to prescription drugs. Again, 40,000 a year die from breast cancer. 40,000 a year die from prostate cancer. 140,000 die from adverse reactions to prescription drugs. And these are reactions to properly prescribed prescription drugs. This does not include medical errors, medical mistakes. If it did, it would at least double and possibly triple this number. So we're not dealing with benign substances here that we can spread around like candy. But I think if you look at the statistics, when you go to most doctors in the United States and you spend your five to 10 minutes with them because there's huge pressure on doctors and I have a lot of empathy for my colleagues who I do believe and know are decent people, highly educated, really trying to help people 
and they are in a pressure cooker where they're being pressurized to see people in a shorter period of time, see more people, keep uh, very complicated health records and reporting. Their reimbursements have been cut to shreds. They're seeing too many people to see in a day. They have to make fast decisions. So pretty much all they feel they can do is see that person, prescribe the medicine, get them out of their office. And that, this number is going to grow if that's how medicine is going to be practiced. You're going to find it's not always true, but that most integrative doctors take the time, take enough time to see people so that they can understand what's going on, they can talk with and motivate the patients, they can educate the patients, um, and they can make the right decision. The downside for the consumer is that you might have to pay them. You might actually have to pay some money because some of these things, the insurance companies do not like to pay for spending time with people. And spending time with people is the only way I know that you can really practice integrative medicine, that you can really practice whole person medicine. Because you can have the best medicine in the world. If people don't take it, it won't work. And if the best medicine in the world is no medicine, but lifestyle change, you've got a lot of education, motivation, and understanding to take place. And that just doesn't take place in five minutes. Then we have lung diseases, stroke, accidents, and so on. And this is from the CDC. This is from the Centers of Disease Control. This is not from me. So there's a big movement now in medicine that's called evidence-based medicine. And it's a good idea, you know, to make medical decisions based on evidence. We like to keep evidence. As a matter of fact, I always say one of the things I respect the most about modern medicine is that we try to track our results. And I think that it's the only system of medicine I know that systematically has tried to track its results over the years. And when published studies come out, we've had a couple of big reversals in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, women's hormones is a good example. When about 10, 12 years ago, a big study came out showing that hormone replacement therapy maybe wasn't the panacea that we thought and perhaps carried dangers of increased cancer risk or heart disease risk. Uh, very, very quickly, doctors turned around and stopped prescribing those hormones so quickly. Um, more and more evidence is coming out now that's modifying that, but we are able to stop. When evidence came out that drugs like Vioxx uh, caused um, a number of cardiac deaths, it went off the market very quickly. So keeping track of what you're doing and having evidence, I'm all in favor of, and it's a really good thing. Trouble again is that there's a huge bias of this in favor of pharmaceuticals because the way we do research, the, the gold standard of double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized studies, only fits certain things, and it fits pharmaceuticals beautifully. It's very hard to do, as a matter of fact, you can't do double-blind studies on something like body work, or acupuncture, or psychology, or guided imagery, because the person knows whether they're getting it or not. And the person who's administering it knows whether they're giving it or not. So you can't just disguise it and give them a phony pill that looks just like the real pill. It also takes, pharmaceuticals have other advantages. They take advantage of a human wish fulfillment. I mean, we like simple answers to complicated problems. Me too. I mean, if there was a pill that you could take that would make you healthy, long-lived, happy, loving, wealthy, sleep well at night, I'd be first in line. No side effects, I would be first in line to take that pill. I have nothing against pharmaceuticals. The trouble is, no such pill exists. The pills have their advantages and they have significant risk factors that go along with them too. But we all want that and the pharmaceutical model offers that. Here, don't worry about, don't change your diet, don't start to exercise, don't institute any stress reduction, don't clean up your relationships, don't work on your emotional well-being, don't think about what life is about and make your life meaningful, just take this pill. It's a lot easier to take the pill. It just doesn't generally work as well. So it may be worth doing some of that other work. The other thing is, is that the pharmaceutical companies can afford double-blind randomized placebo control trials. They're hugely expensive. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do. 
And, you know, the interesting thing I will mention, do you know why we do those complex hundreds of million dollar studies? The reason we do them is to make sure that the only reason the person got better was not because they expected to get better. That's what that whole methodology is about. Because the power of the mind and the power of expectation is so powerful that if you know you're getting a f the real thing, the real pill, if you believe you've been given a treatment that will help you, 30 to 70% of the time you'll get better, even if it's the fake pill. And even if you don't know whether you got the fake pill, if the person who gives it to you knows whether it's the real pill or the fake pill, you'll get better. So we know that the power of the mind is so strong, we have to go to these extraordinary lengths to eliminate its effects. And that's the only reason we do those studies. So when we get to mind-body things, remember that the mind-body effect is the most highly researched effect in all of medicine because it gets researched every time a medicine gets researched. Now, evidence-based medicine is a good idea, but there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of bias in it. There's a lot of conflicting evidence. The evidence is often of very poor quality and even when we have good evidence, the v utilization of it is highly, highly variable by physicians and patients alike. So I started to talk about placebo and mind-body effects, which are among the most important and effective um, phenomena in medicine. And really, when you think about the effect of the human mind on our well-being and health, it's the difference between human and veterinary medicine. In veterinary medicine, you don't need to use psychology. In human medicine, if you don't meet that person, find out who they are, what their likes and dislikes and biases and availability for learning new things are, you're gonna have trouble getting them to take the medication. So even in our highly pharmaceuticalized world, we know generally that fewer than half of patients actually take the medicines that the doctors prescribe. And when they take them, Fewer than that take them in the right dose and at the right time. And then you get this phenomenon where, you know, especially in people over 70 to 75 are on an average of six to 12 drugs at a time. Who knows what's going on in somebody's body when you're taking 12 different drugs? It's amazing that we can even do that. And it's a testament really to the resilience of the body. So we can use that, what's called the placebo effect. I think if you change the name of placebo effect to mind-body healing effect, it's more realistic. Because people think placebo means I just got tricked into healing. Well, sort of. But what it really means is that when your mind or your brain thinks that it's gotten something that's healing for it, it actually turns on processes that are healing in the body. It sends out different signals down through the nervous system and down through the hormone system and to the immune system, and you start to feel better. So that's an effect that we can actually learn to use on purpose. We don't have to fool ourselves. We can say, hey, if I can get fooled into healing, maybe I can find the mechanism, I can find the switch, and I can turn it on myself. And there's a lot of evidence to show that you can. Dr. Ken Pelletier, who's one of the great authorities in researching uh, integrative medicine. In his book called Alternative Medicine, What Works and What Doesn't, which is considered to be the Bible of, of this field by corporations and governments all over the world, he said that there's more evidence for more conditions and more people than in any other field of medicine for the effects of mind-body medicine. And it's true. Because how you handle stress and emotions may be the single most important controllable aspect of your health. Focusing and relaxing, reducing stress are some of the most important things you can do because you are not only what you eat, but you're what you think as well. So nutrition, of course, there's a huge knowledge of human nutrition, but most doctors don't know it. Most doctors, you know, as a medical doctor, I went to the University of Michigan Medical School, fine medical school. Most doctors get maybe 12 to 15 hours of education. This is in tens of thousands of hours of studying medicine and health. We might get 12, 
to 15 hours. Some only get six hours in their four-year medical curriculum, and you never see it again. So a doctor who wants to learn about human nutrition has to study after they graduate. They have to take continuing education. There are tens of thousands of studies in human nutrition. There's a huge literature. We know a lot more about it, even though it can be a very confusing area. You know, I mentioned the mind-body difference as a difference between human and veterinary medicine. The other difference between human and veterinary medicine is veterinarians know a huge amount about animal nutrition in various species. Of course, they have a bit of an advantage because you can get, you know, Purina dog chow and cat chow and horse chow. We don't have human chow. <laughs> People eat for a lot of different reasons, for pleasure, for sociability, for cultural identity, uh, to control their emotions, to reduce their stress, to speed them up, to slow them down. And so again, this is a place where the humanness of the relationship between the doctor and the patient comes in because how do you get people to make changes? You have to have a relationship. You, they need to trust you. They need to believe you not only know what you're doing, but you also care about them. It's also kind of crazy to me that both mind-body medicine and nutritional medicine should be considered alternative medicine. That's insane. They are the fundamentals of health. Those plus movement and exercise are the three fundamental things that a person needs to do in order to allow their body to fulfill its genetic potential. You eat well, um, don't drive yourself crazy with your mind, learn how to use it to relax and reduce stress and enjoy life, and give your body some movement. You know, that's why we don't have roots like plants. We are made to move. So in integrative medicine, a lot of us do uh, use a model that's called functional medicine or something like it where we not only do uh, help people find ways to eat better, which is the most important thing, but we might also do laboratory assessments of your blood and your biochemistry to find out um, what your vitamin levels are and mineral levels and antioxidant levels. Uh, we might look at uh, what's going on in your uh, digestive tract through stool analysis to see if you're absorbing the food you eat, if you're digesting well, if you have inflammation in your gut, if you have a healthy growth of the normal bacteria that live with us, the, the microbiome that's getting so much attention these days because we have 10 times as many bacterial cells in our body that live in our gut as we do cells in our body. And they help to control our immunity, even our mood. Um, there's some startling research about how important these are to our health. And so we're looking at all of that as well. Then there are what you might think of of alternative or complementary methods like acupuncture. Acupuncture is an amazing phenomenon. It's somewhere between five to 15,000 years old. It's been treating a third to a quarter of the people in the world all that time. We just learned about it back in 1971. I got interested in it very early and have been doing it ever since. And modern research shows that there are neurotransmitter mechanisms, that it affects chemicals in the brain, it relaxes muscles, it improves circulation, it balances the autonomic nervous system that runs the internal uh, functions of the body, it increases stress resilience, so you can take more stress with fewer adverse effects, it can relieve pain, it can modulate mood. It's a wonderful thing it has. If it's done properly, we use disposable needles and sterile technique. And side effects are, are very, very close to nil if you see somebody who is careful and knows what they're doing. It can't treat everything. I think acupuncture works well for about 50 to 70% of the things that we see in a medical practice. And a trial of about six treatments will show you if it's worthwhile or not. If you're feeling better, you might need more treatments than that, but if you're not feeling better by about six treatments, then you've tried it and you probably shouldn't pursue it anymore. And that comes from a huge study done at UCLA in the 70s where they treated 25,000 chronic pain patients with 10 treatments of acupuncture. So they did 250,000 acupuncture treatments and they found that the people who would benefit will start to benefit in the first six treatments. So if you do six treatments, you don't benefit. 
look in another direction. If you do benefit, you'll probably end up needing a dozen or so treatments, and that may be over three or four months, because not everybody responds to it. Some people respond to it uh, very strongly, and some people don't respond to it at all. Extremely safe, and what, however you explain acupuncture, what it does is it seems to stimulate and balance the built-in healing systems of the body. So there's a lot of resources you can look at. There's a National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine and the National Institutes of Health. They have a website. There's the Institute for Functional Medicine website, Dr. Andrew Weil's website, our Healing Mind website. Um, Mayo Clinic endorses many of these alternatives. Sloan Kettering uh, has great information about a lot of these alternatives. So it's something that is coming more and more into the mainstream because Really, an integrative approach doesn't take anything away from medicine. It takes conventional medicine and adds to it the healing power of nutrition, of stress management, of mind-body medicine, and of complementary techniques like acupuncture and body work, osteopathic medicine, and more. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope that this was worthwhile to you. I'm Dr. Marty Rossman for The Healing Mind.